I'm Chuck Schuster, and I'm an extension educator that uh, works in the central cluster of the state of Maryland. And, you know, we look at the more rural areas and we think, wow, the rural areas are really struggling. But even as we look in the central cluster, in some of the, the uh, areas of Montgomery and Frederick and Howard counties, where we're very urbanized, uh, we, we still see a tremendous amount of stress that's going on. And we, we need to looking, be able to look at, okay, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to recognize some of these things? And then how am I going to react to some of these? And that's really important. And we want to think about that. We want to think about how are we going to step up and, and look at this? So how do you talk to someone who's struggling with a tremendous amount of stress? What are you going to say to them? How are you going to approach them? Because remember, the last thing we want to do is make them feel uncomfortable and not want to see us come back. So we want to remember that. That's really, really important. And we do see people. And, uh, you know, Jenny talks about the fact that, you know, people call her up. I had a husband and wife that showed up and she was crying. They didn't take an income last year at all. They had bought a new farm and the farm didn't pay for itself, didn't make the mortgage payment. And, you know, they will survive because they had savings. Uh, but they had never experienced this in their life. And they, and they came to talk to me. So as we think about what we're going to do, we have to think about how we're going to approach that person. And we don't want to do this cold. We really don't want to do this cold. How many of you feel comfortable and confident going up to that person and opening that conversation door. Good. I hope by the end of the day, more of you have a confidence level that's going to allow you to be willing to take that step, to really consider going out. Um, you don't want to just go at it cold. We often know well in advance that there's so-and-so struggling. We know in general crop prices are way down. Well, but they farm a thousand acres. Well, that's a thousand acres times loss that we have to think about. So we, you know, Emily mentioned, we start to see the little subtle things. You know, the fences aren't painted. Um, when things break, they're not being repaired those types of things that should start to cue in our brain okay i need to be prepared to go and have this conversation so we're going to look at the idea of learning how to become an active listener my wife and i we like to go out to um, dinner and it's very often that we'll sit at the local restaurant as we have dinner and we look around at the other tables and we see what goes on at the other tables so there is mom and dad with two teenagers, and the teenagers are sitting there on their phones, but they're communicating with each other. Why can't we put the phone down? I know as an educator, when I stand up and teach, I look across my, my class and I look at, are they listening? Or, as we all do, are they bifurcating, trying to multitask? But when we go into a stressful situation, we've got to learn how to be a very active listener. This is a situation where eye contact is paramount. You want them to know that you've got, they've got your attention. So you really want to think about how can I be that active listener and how can I make sure that I'm going to focus on them What's my duration? How much time do I have? I've got to, I've got to be thinking about all of this. Um, I've got to have developed a plan that I'm willing to use as I approach this friend, this colleague, this client, this just general member of the community. You know, in many cases, we are a contact that they get very used to. And, you know, we, we do the high and yes, for this weed, you're going to use this control. And yes, I know your nutrient management plan's up to date. I signed it. 
but now it's going to be, I really need to talk to, to you. And are you prepared to listen? And we, we have to think about the things we say and the things we don't say as we prepare to work with these individuals. So, prior to going, I start to come up with my action plan. Uh, I like things laid out pretty well, so I'm ready to rock and roll when I'm gonna meet with somebody. Um, but every now and then, you know, I'm gonna get caught a little off guard. Someone's gonna walk into my office and just wanna chat. So I need to have well thought out ahead of time some basic things I'm going to do. You know, if I'm going to the farm, why am I going? Oh, I got called. They said they had a problem with, you know, Palmer. That was the excuse to get me out there. Can you make sure this is Palmer? Uh, can you come out and talk to me? Am I meeting with one person? Am I meeting with husband and wife? Am I meeting with the farm team? Uh, in some cases, which is uh, father and two sons or father and, and siblings that are all operating the farm? Who has ultimate, I, I wanna know, okay, who am I planning to meet with and who does what? So I, I plan for things like this. Who else might I encounter there? What else might I encounter? What, what's the worst case scenario here? You know, we, we've actually had discussions on learning how to ask that question you don't want to ask. And we'll talk about that after lunch. That question about, are you thinking about something? Plan on generating enough time. Who doesn't have a busy schedule? I thought so. How many of you have a place you could be someplace other than here today? We all do. But you all took time because you recognize that this is important. So when you go to meet with somebody, make sure you've carved out enough time so that you can go and listen. Now that doesn't mean you spend the night, but in some cases it might mean you're gonna stay late. It might mean you might have to step out and cancel something else if this is really developing into something that is very, very important to us. Um, have in mind what resources you have available. I'm not saying you need the money to back this farmer up, but do we know who we need to contact? You know, the question was asked here on the shore, do we have the low cost mental health resources? Do I know how to get a, a hold of farm credit and the people at farm credit? Um, am I prepared to call, you know, 911 if necessary? So know where my resources are and, and, and kind of have that in your, your notebook ready to use as you might be needing. What are you going to go in with? You know, very often we're going into a setting and we're meeting with a family and we know a little bit of stuff is going on. But are you prepared to take notes? Did you bring pad and paper? Because you are probably going to leave with a task list. And are you prepared to take notes? Because the last thing you want to do is to miss something on your task list. What they need most is you to do what you say you're going to do. So take a notebook, take a pad and paper so that you can go back. And then, you know, look at what are your abilities to really help? What are your long-term and what are your short-term goals? Where are they today? How are you trying to help them in the next month, six months, and hopefully help them so that they develop a much bigger plan so that they're looking at a successful future. Now, success does not necessarily mean staying on the farm. And sometimes we have to recognize that. Sometimes we have to recognize that in some cases that situations, debt load, et cetera, has just gotten beyond what is capable of being handled and we need to be able to plan to step away. So that's, a, that's an important thing we wanna think about. How we approach somebody though 
is very, very important. And I want to show you a video that talks about this idea of having empathy versus having sympathy and really helping people there. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Some of those answers, wow. You know, it's like losing a parent. If you haven't lost a parent, you don't know what it's like to lose a parent. Um, and once you've gone through it, then you can really empathize with everybody else that's been through losing a parent. That's, that's a tough thing to go through. Um, you know, as we get older, it it's, becomes a fact of life. So, you know, we learn about the, this thing. It's kind of like you joined a club, uh, not necessarily a club you wanted to join. So, in the process, and you know, as you start to think, we have to learn to be careful with our words. And being careful, you need to be careful and not need to say, oops, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. So we need to plan. We need to really start to think, how would it feel to be in their situation and what kind of a response would I like? And sometimes it's not necessarily a response. Sometimes it's just the matter that you are there, you are listening, you're actively listening. You're not checking the, oh, my phone buzzed. That must have been an email. Who needs me next? You're giving them 100% of your attention. And that is really, really important. Do you have empathy for their situation? I think those of us involved in agriculture in a lot of ways do, but it doesn't mean we're prepared to walk into a situation and start to deal with someone that's really struggling if we haven't thought ahead of time about what we're going to do. 
Do we have all the answers at our fingertips? No. And we shouldn't, you know, one of the first rules I learned as an extension educator, it's okay to say, I don't know, but I will get back to you. Then write that down because you want to fall back on that when you leave because you want to make sure you do complete what you say you're going to do. So you want to spend time helping them think, not telling them what they've done wrong, but helping them go through the process. Okay, what's happened? What are the possible outcomes? What are some of the potential solutions? What decisions have to be made? This is time we just spent in gentle conversation. As we go into this, you know, I value my relationships with my fellow members of the ag community. I really do value them. And I look at my farmers and I talk to my farmers and I see them, you know, whether it be I'm out on my own personal time and I run into them in a restaurant uh, or whether, you know, I'm at a meeting and we see, I value that. I value the fact that they have trust, they have faith, and they come to me for potential solutions. And we've got to make sure that as we work with them, that we think about what can I do to hold on to this relationship? Being honest, being a listening person, these are very, very important. We need to make sure that we're careful that we don't give them false hopes, that we help them identify where their problems are, and we help them understand, I'm here to really see what we can do together. Now, I need to do this in a safe situation. After lunch, we're going to talk about the very difficult topic of suicide. And we're going to look at that. And we need to make sure that while we're listening, we are in a safe place. We also need to be thinking about, okay, let's have a purpose for the discussion. It's not just, you know, you're going to pour out your guts and woe is me. Let's talk about over a course of a period of meetings, possibly, how we are going to remember that we're going to work with them. They need answers, but they need appropriate answers. They need to be part of the solution. So we want to work with them slowly and gently as we help them tease out what could be solutions rather than just say, well, you need to change this, this, and this. Well, we need to understand why they do certain things and we need to help them through that. So we look at this, the active listening continuum. We're going to ask just general questions and they're going to give us some answers but maybe the answer isn't enough for us to really determine much, so we're going to start to tease out more. We're going to probe, and we're going to pour more information out of that. And it's very important that we, we spend the time as we help pull that information out. It is very, very important. Um, we're trying to gather more information so we can help them make decisions. Again, we're paying attention. The attend means we're attending to the business at hand, we're listening, we're making sure that we don't divert our attention away unless it's simply to write notes. General, quick, easy to remember notes. But we live in a state of mind in which we can multitask so quickly and easily that very often we forget that simply picking up the phone to, who was that that just called? That means I was paying more attention to my phone for a couple seconds. Did they hear what I said? It's very good to restate what they said because I want to make sure that I understood what they meant. And sometimes that's not as easy as it might seem. So I heard you say, is this what you mean? I might paraphrase it. We've got to work on the word wrap. <laughs> and then we will summarize, and then potentially I'm going to reframe what was stated. I'm going to be neutral. I'm going to be unbiased. But I'm going to make sure that 
I'm hearing what the speaker is telling me. Carefully, gently listening. I'm not putting my feelings into this at all. So, I look at phrases like, I can see that the current situation is hard for you. What changes would you like to see? What do they want? Um, I'm eager to help you. I know you're going through some tough challenges. Tell me what I can do to help. Remember, don't make promises you can't keep. I hear you say. It sounds like you're thinking that selling the cows and just going into commodities, uh, changing the mix, but restate so that you make sure that you actually hear what they're trying to say and we don't misunderstand things. So take a moment with the people that are sitting near you, come up with a list of three things other than what's listed here that you might find helpful to say. We're going to spend just a couple minutes and then we're going to have just a few tables report back. But think about what other types of things could you say that might be useful in a situation where you're sitting down on a one-on-one -on -one across the kitchen table, out at the barn, in the machine shop, any place, as they're trying to, they're, they're sharing what's going on that's generating a tremendous amount of stress with them. So, just a couple minutes. Go. Who'd like to share one that they came up with? Yes, sir. Tell me more. You've given me the basic, very loose framework. Give me some more details. Okay, tell me more. Very good. Did you have one? I don't know exactly how you feel, but I've been in similar situations, and this is what I try. This is what I do. I don't know exactly how you feel, but I've been in similar situations, and here are some of the things I tried. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my go to question is what do you need in this moment? Because that empowers them, it brings them to the present moment to get out of the fear base of the future. It empowers them to come up with, it just shifts, reframes their own thinking. Um, and it, it just gives them some responsibility in the moment. Do they want that responsibility? Most often? Oh, yes. So. Yes. Absolutely. They don't want to be dictated to, but it's, it's useful to help pull them back. What do you need in this moment? Right now. Where can I help you with this moment? Help them focus. What is the here and now? And how can I have steps that move us forward? You had a good one. What can I do, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? Again, we're not telling them. We're asking and we're giving them an opportunity to think and define what, what they really want to come out of this. Really, what's going to come out of this? So, here's a couple ideas. How many of us can't use the first statement? I know of several farms in similar situations. Unfortunately, we, we, we have enough of that. But we remember, Second one is very good too. And every, situ every situation is a little different. This is our probe. Help me understand better. Have you thought about giving them an opportunity to not be told you need to make this change? Here's an idea. How might it fit for your situation? for your particular labor force, for the equipment you have, for the type of land you have. You know, we look at coming off of 2018, 
and with a tremendous amount of moisture and the fact that, you know, in some cases, cover crops couldn't be planted, commodity wheat couldn't get planted. So that's starting to set them up for already having problems in the future. They lost cover crop payments. They didn't get wheat in, which meant straw, which meant wheat to sell. Okay? Have you thought about something else? Have you thought about coming in and doing something else? I could maybe help with, keep it basic, I think that if we, the we is important, we're st still wanting them to engage and to have input into the decision process. This new idea might, and then a, a potential idea, what do you think? And then sit down and do your balance sheet, pros and cons. Not balance sheet as in finances, but okay, with what I'm doing, will this work, will it not work? You know, who would have thought that just a couple years ago there would be a new farm in Montgomery County, a new dairy farm in Montgomery County? But they decided that they were gonna do something totally different. And they process their own milk, they make their own ice cream, and it fits in with their fruit and vegetable industry. Somebody came up with an idea. Now, is that a model for everybody? No. So it's not the, the perfect solution to every dairy farm that's struggling across the state, the region, the nation. But it's, you know, we, we look at what's the locality. How might it fit in? So we think about all of these. We remember well, let me re rephrase that. How well do you think when you're under stress? Poorly. Poorly. We, we don't come up with some of our better solutions at that point in time. So remember, when we're dealing with people that are under stress, that they're not necessarily going to do their best work. So maybe it's going to be, we've opened the door, we've taken step one, but we're gonna come back and we're gonna meet again and we're going to flesh this out a little bit more. Put a few more pieces of the puzzle together, giving them time. Don't press that we've gotta have a decision today. Don't press that we need to know where we're going today. We're opening the door, we're giving them the potential that, okay, someone's listening and maybe they do have something to offer, and you know, another cup of coffee in a couple days might be well worth my time. So, you know, give them that time. Be sensitive as we try to help people organize their information in a way that's going to help them to remember and to process what was discussed. Maybe your list needs to be a side-by-side -side list, I'm doing this, you're going to do this. Here's a couple things you can help me with. And help them remember what they're going to start to gather. So that you know, we can have a discussion that's going to help us look at maybe it's numbers. So help them because they're often going to be so overwhelmed with just the stress that they're going to forget some of the things that they've uh, been told to do. Then remember that we possibly made a commitment to do things, get information, get them phone numbers, hook them up with people. Put a time limit on that. When will you be back in touch? How will you be back in touch? I'm going to call you. When's a good time to call? I'm going to stop by. I'm going to mail you. Let them know what they should expect. And then, probably most importantly, follow through. That follow through can be critical and we really want to make sure that we take the time to follow through.
follow-up, even if it's nothing more than a, was out last Wednesday, we had a discussion, I just wanted to check in on you. It might be the next day. I know you're under a lot of stress. I know things aren't going necessarily real well. Just wanted to touch base. How are you today? When can we meet again? Maybe they were resistant to having a follow-up meeting. And maybe it's just a matter of you care enough that that meant enough that they're going to crack that door just a little bit more. How many of you had a difficult ag producer at some point in time in your career and they've thrown you just the littlest piece of a morsel to go do something for them and when you did it, it was like, wow, you did that for me? I mean, ag agents, how many times have we been given the the private applicator recertification renewal stinks and I can't seem to get it to work. I threw away my card so I don't have the magic code and then we help them. But think about that. Sometimes they give us just a morsel to work with, but if we run with that morsel and come back, then that's going to help them feel a lot more comfortable with us. And that's going to be very, very important. You know, in the, the day of the modern cell phone, it's not a matter of catching them in the house anymore. And that's a benefit. But also remember sometimes when they see that number pop up, maybe they're not ready to talk, but leave a message. Let them know that yes, I'm ready to follow up or I'm just checking in. So, remember, we can't solve it all. We can't solve it all. Remember what our role is. At this point in time, we're listening. At this point in time, we're, we're information gathering. Uh, we're dealing with, in some cases, tremendous amounts of stress and they feel like they're buried at the bottom of the pit and instead of, just like the video showed, standing up, and top, up on top and looking down, maybe we need to crawl down with them. But don't promise more than you can do. Be ready to reach out for others. Be ready to be able to have those phone numbers that are so vital so that we can help them get the connections with us sometimes even offer, can I come over and sit down and make the call with you? So that they really do feel that commitment that uh, is very, very important to them. We might be also looking at what other things can you do? What what neat skills do they have that maybe they could turn that skill into an income? How many farmers do you know that aren't fairly good with mechanics? So could they take some of that ability and then start to turn a side income of bringing something in that wasn't necessarily related to farming because they always did their own work, but now they're going to be willing to help someone else. And, you know, we, we actually met a farmer while we were in Michigan who had turned into a politician after going through a real downturn in his farm business and uh, really had devastated him. But one of the things he's doing now, besides being a politician, he and his son are re doing mechanical repairs. And they apparently have a fairly successful uh, mechanical repair business. So we need to make sure that we um, take our time and we learn how to talk to farmers. In your packet, you will have a handout, how to talk to farmers under stress. Uh, it's something that's very useful to review uh, as we think about how we're going to plan to work with the farmers. It's 
good to have thought about how I'm going to approach them prior to showing up. I don't want to necessarily just show up and um, not be prepared myself. Not be prepared in some cases to some of the comments that I might be told. So, it, any questions? It's a, difficult, it's a difficult place to find ourselves in at times. Um, those of us that are parents, we've been in situations with our children where sometimes we have to sit down with them to have difficult discussions. This is, this is harder yet. This is harder yet. 